Now that we've examined how molecules absorb and emit light, let's look at how light can drive chemical reactions. Photochemistry is the study of chemical reactions that are initiated by light. This image illustrates that there is a lot of energy coming from the sun in the form of light, and solar irradiation is an important driver of chemical reactions that sustain life on our planet. One of those reaction mechanisms occurs in the ozone layer above the Earth, preventing harmful UV radiation to reach the surface. On the left is part one of this scheme, where sunlight photolyzes or cleaves O2 molecules into two oxygen atoms. This creates a pool of oxygen atoms so that the second process can occur. In this second process, the oxygen atoms react with other oxygen molecules to form ozone. Then, light from the sun is absorbed by ozone to revert it back to O2 and an oxygen atom. This interconversion between ozone and O2 with an oxygen atom is the process that converts harmful UV light to thermal energy, thereby protecting life on the planet's surface below. Ozone can be lost if it reacts with an oxygen molecule or with other trace gases such as chlorine. This is why the Montreal Protocol was established to ban the emission of ozone-depleting substances like chlorofluorocarbons. This interconversion occurs in the stratosphere and blocks the higher frequency UV light. This is why we still need to apply sunscreen to protect us from the lower frequency UVA light. Another important photochemical reaction that sustains life on Earth is photosynthesis. This is the process that converts light, carbon dioxide, and water to sugar and oxygen. When talking about any process that absorbs light to drive a reaction, then its efficiency can be quantified by its quantum yield. A process's quantum yield is the rate of an event occurring divided by the rate of photon absorption. At first glance, it would be logical to think that the best quantum yield possible would be equal to 1. However, it is possible for the rate of an event to occur to be higher than the rate of photon absorption. For example, the photochemical decomposition of HI has a quantum yield of 2. This is because the absorption of one photon results in the decomposition of two HI molecules. In the first step of this mechanism, the photon is absorbed and splits the HI molecule. The hydrogen radical, which is produced, finds a second HI molecule and forms an H2 molecule and another iodine radical. The two remaining iodine radicals react to form I2. So, only one photon was necessary to decompose two HI molecules. We are going to use quantum yields to quantify the efficiency of photochemical reactions. Before we do that, we also need to quantify the rates of these processes using standard rate law kinetics. We will now quantify the decay of an excited system. While the light is on, then there will be absorption, where we convert molecules from their ground state, denoted here as a singlet, to an excited singlet state, denoted here as S star. The rate of this transition is expressed as I ABS, as was already defined when we talked about quantum yield. Three typical decay terms are fluorescence, intersystem crossing, and internal conversion. Fluorescence is simply the electron relaxing and releasing a photon. It is a rate of Kf times the concentration of S star. Intersystem crossing is where the spin of the excited electron changes. It is typically a slow process, but these types of events leads to phosphorescence. It is a rate of Kisc times the concentration of S star. Finally, internal conversion is where the system directs the energy from the absorbed photon towards another process, relaxing the system without giving off a photon. One example of this, where the excitation of the electron also leads to an excited vibrational state that relaxes back to the ground state through various vibrational modes. It has a rate of Kic times the concentration of S star. So when the light source is turned off, the rate of decay of the system, meaning the rate of change of S star with respect to time, is Kf times the concentration of S star plus Kisc times the concentration of S star plus Kic times the concentration of S star. We can distribute out the concentration of S star to simplify the expression. This is a first order process. We can integrate both sides to get an integrated rate law expression. 
the concentration of S star is equal to the original concentration of S star times E raised to the power of negative KF plus KISC plus KIC, all times the time T. We can define a term called the observed fluorescence lifetime, denoted here as tau naught, as 1 over KF plus KISC plus KIC. This term quantifies how long it takes the system to lose about two-thirds of the original amount of S star. Let's now quantify how many light-emitting events a system produces relative to all light-related events. This is so that we can quantify how efficient a system is if we are interested in using it for a particular purpose. Using the definition of quantum yield and the result of the rate law discussion, we can define something called the quantum yield of fluorescence. It is the rate of fluorescence divided by the rate of photon absorption. Substituting in the rate law terms, the quantum yield of fluorescence is equal to Kf times the concentration of S star divided by Kf plus Kisc plus Kic all times the concentration of S star. The concentration of S star term cancels out, and we can also substitute in the observed fluorescence lifetime. This means the quantum yield of fluorescence is equal to Kf times tau naught. We've discussed how the system naturally relaxes. We can also introduce other species into the system which can interact with the excited state to remove its energy. This is called quenching. We will examine three quenching processes, collisional deactivation, fluorescence resonance energy transfer, and electron transfer. Looking first at collisional quenching, this new mechanism of decay involves a reaction between S star and the quencher Q, resulting in a relaxed S and Q. The rate of this process is quantified as kq times the concentration of S star times the concentration of q. This means that when quenching is taken into account, the new rate law of the decay of S is kf times the concentration of S star plus kisc times the concentration of S star plus kic times the concentration of S star plus kq times the concentration of S star times the concentration of q. The relationship between the fluorescence quantum yields without a quencher, denoted as capital Phi F naught, and with a quencher, denoted as capital Phi F, is given by stern volmer equation, where the quantum yield of fluorescence without a quencher divided by the quantum yield of fluorescence with the quencher is equal to 1 plus tau naught times kq times the concentration of the quencher. So, when increasing the concentration of the quencher, the quantum yield of fluorescence with the quencher term goes down, meaning that the ratio of phi f naught over phi f gets larger. The slope of these plots is equal to tau naught times kq, the rate constant of the quenching process. So these plots can be used to determine one of these parameters if the other is already known. Let's look at the second quenching process, fluorescence resonance energy transfer. Through a dipole-dipole interaction, the energy from absorbing a photon in one region of a molecule can be transferred to another part. This is an important process for light harvesting in many biological systems. The figure on the right illustrates fluorescence resonance energy transfer. Part of the molecule absorbs light and is excited. It then transfers that energy to a different part of the molecule which excites it. The excited second part then relaxes, giving off a photon. This process no longer works if the two parts are separated. This process also works best with a high overlap of the emission spectrum of S star, being the excited absorbing part of the molecule, with the absorption spectrum of Q, being the quenching part of the molecule that ultimately radiates the photon. The efficiency of this process, denoted as eta fret, is equal to the quantum yield of fluorescence without the quencher minus the quantum yield of fluorescence with the quencher divided by the quantum yield of fluorescence without the quencher. Forster's theory quantifies the efficiency of this energy transfer through covalent bonds or protein scaffolds as a function of the distance between the two parts. This alternatively quantifies eta fret to be equal to r naught to the power of 6 divided by r naught to the power of 6 plus r raised to the power of 6, where r is the distance between the two parts, and r0 is a parameter that is characteristic of each donor acceptor pair, where values typically range around 4 nanometers. This means that the efficiency of this process is distance dependent. 
As the distance between the absorber and the quencher increases, R gets larger, and the denominator of this term gets bigger. This means the efficiency of this transfer process gets smaller. As a result, we can use fluorescence resonance energy transfer as a molecular ruler, since we can resolve different efficiencies for different distances. The final quenching process we'll examine is electron transfer. Electron transfer is a quenching process where an electron is transferred from the excited molecule to the quenching molecule. This is illustrated in the diagram. The observed rate constant of the electron transfer process, denoted here as KEXP, depends on two factors, the separation between the donor and the acceptor, and the Gibbs energy of activation. These two factors put together give KEXP being proportional to E raised to the power of negative beta R times E raised to the power of the negative of the Gibbs energy of activation divided by Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. In this relationship, beta is a constant that varies as a function of the system of interest and the medium in which electron transfer occurs. Now that we've examined these quenching processes, let's look at an example which uses them, photosynthesis. Antenna pigments are used to harvest light from the sun, and fluorescence resonance energy transfer moves that energy to the reaction center. In the reaction center, the mechanism that converts carbon dioxide and water into sugar and oxygen involves two electron transfer processes that are initiated by the energy harvested by the, ener the antenna pigments. Being able to describe quenching processes enables our ability to quantify important biological processes such as this. This lecture was divided into two parts. The first part was on electronic transitions. The energy for electronic transitions are the largest of the three types of molecular excitations. While electronic excitations can occur between any two energy levels, some characteristic transitions are observed due to specific functional groups. These chemical entities, which are embedded within a molecule that absorbs radiation at nearly the same wavelength in different molecules, are called chromophores. They can be used to ID certain transitions. The Frank Condon principle states that transitions between electronic states correspond to vertical lines on an energy versus internuclear distance diagram. These diagrams can be used to predict the dominant vibrational state in the excited molecule. And finally, fluorescence is the spontaneously emitted radiation immediately following absorption, whereas phosphorescence is a spontaneous emission which may persist for long periods. The second part of this lecture was focused on photochemistry. We discussed how the interaction of molecules with light plays a key role in supporting life on Earth. And the rate at which excited molecules decay can be described with standard kinetic theory. The rate at which systems relax can be accelerated by quenching molecules. And these quenching processes such as fluorescence resonant energy transfer and electron transfer are important for life-sustaining chemical reactions.